When I was in, in fourth grade, I went to a basketball clinic that was held by the head coach at our school. Uh, I love basketball, and I wanted to, I wanted to be uh, one of the players on the varsity one day, and so I went to this, this uh, clinic and was trying to learn from him. Day one, we walk in, and the very first thing the coach taught us, there was no ball, there was no passing, there was no shooting, there was no nothing. He just wanted to teach us to be ready. So there is this, like he, he called it, the ready position. They're called the triple threat, threat position in other sports, an athletic position. But it's basically you get up on the balls of your feet because you're wanting to move. You're wanting to pounce. You want to be like a cat. So you get up on the balls of your feet. You don't stay back here like this, but you keep moving. It, there's always some activity. You get athletic so that you can do something, that you can go somewhere. And I want to say today that Jesus taught a parable about being ready. It's an important parable, and it's a parable for our times. I don't know if it's exactly uh, for this moment in history, but I guarantee you it's a moment for us. Have you noticed that our world has changed a little bit in the last year? Um, I had one of those like, whoa, 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 uh, how my life has changed in just one year uh, moments. I uh, went to a new bank um, refinancing our loan, interest rates are really good. You might want to do that. Um, so I was going to going to brand new bank. I was walking up. I was walking up the sidewalk, and uh, you know, looking at the door, and I could see I didn't have my mask on. So I stood in front of the door and put a mask on, and then walked into a bank. And I thought, wow, has life changed? <laughs> Think about that for a second. A year ago, I'm like, a year ago, who would have put a mask on? to walk into a bank, and now, like, you don't dare walk into a bank without a mask on. Just our world has changed. So many people have been asking me, Pastor, is this the end times? Can I give you my answer? No, but it's the time to get us ready for it. It's, it's not the end times right now, but it's the time to get us ready for it. But if you ask nine out of ten pastors, they did a poll, nine out of ten pastors said, this is the end times. I guess I'm the one that didn't. I'm like, like you better get ready. It is, it is always time to get ready. Didn't you love the, the songs? Like you have a calling in that you can make history. We live in a time where you can make history, not, not change the world, just, man, begin to change your own life and it will change the history of your family. It'll change everything about you. Like it is time to know that our decisions are making history. Jesus uh, told a parable in Matthew chapter 25. Uh, this is an important parable all about getting ready. Uh, so today, if, if, if you go home and put on your Instagram or Facebook or something, my pastor doesn't think this is the end time, please don't do that. <laughs> Please don't even go back and say that I did say it was the end times. I, I just go back and say, my pastor said it's time to get ready. Like that, that's what Jesus taught, and that's what we want to do. You know, I think many of us look at the signs, like Matthew 25 follows Matthew 24. <laughs> you learned it right here. Um, <laughs> Matthew 24 is all about signs of the end times. Like one of them was, hey, uh, they were walking by the temple, and Jesus said, One day, not one stone of this temple will be left upon another. You know what? Forty years later, that temple was torn down. And I learned from a, a Jewish historian that the reason why it was torn completely apart was that they burned the temple first, and all of the gold melted, and just went down between all of the rocks and all the stones. And they were so greedy that they tore it completely apart, to get every bit of the gold out of it and fulfilled his prophecy. Many people are seeing the signs in Matthew 24. It says, you know, the earthquakes and the famines and the pestilence in many places. And, you know, they talk about the wildfires of America and they talk about the hurricanes lining up. I, you know, that's such Americans talking about America. <laughs> you know what? Uh, America is not the center of the spiritual universe. The center of the spiritual universe is Jerusalem. And what we really need to do is focus on, like, like, not what's happening in America, but what's happening in Jerusalem at all moments. 
it's really important for us. Can I just teach you one sign of the end times that we need to really be paying attention to? Pay attention to that Temple Mount. Here's a picture of it, if you don't know the Temple Mount. Uh, and you would think, what's that thing right in the middle? If that's the Temple Mount, what's the thing right in the middle? Did anybody say the temple? It's not the temple. Um, that's the El Aska Mosque. Uh, that's called the Dome of the Rock. It's one of the most holy Muslim areas in the, in the whole wide world. It was built where the temple used to be. You see the flat area that's right around that? That whole area on top is the Temple Mount. It is the most holy place of Judaism. It's one of the most holy places of Islam. And uh, the Christians, you know, it's, it's obviously holy there because of what Jesus has done and taught and how many times he was there. So it's this place that's so, so important to our world. This week in uh, Washington, D.C., an Abrahamic peace accords was signed. Part of that Abrahamic peace accords, um, it was between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, uh, other countries are signing into this. Um, what's so important about that is there is a, a line in there that says the Temple Mount is to be shared by the Christians, Muslims, and Jewish people equally. <laughs> like that is a sign of the times. <laughs> that, that's a big, that's a really big one. Today is Yom Kippur. It's the most holy day of Judaism. On Yom Kippur, uh, it's the day of atonement. It's the day in which the sins of the Jewish people are placed upon an animal. That animal is sacrificed, and then their sins are forgiven. Uh, Jesus was the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus was the one that made atonement for your sins and my sins. And, and so the incredible thing is that's being said uh, celebrated today in Jerusalem. Do you know how they do it? They do it with a shofar. Shofar is a big, big ram's horn, um, and it makes uh, the, a sound like an elephant would make. It's a loud, loud noise. I won't make the sound, but it's an incredibly loud noise that's meant to wake people up. That's the whole purpose of it. Whenever you see or hear the shofar, it's to wake up, wake up. And on this day, that is being played. So I want to share this in Matthew chapter 25. That all sets up Matthew 25. Jesus tells this parable. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. So these ten bridesmaids, um, they all had lamps because there was no electricity. If you were going to get married and it was dark where you were getting married, they needed light. You needed to see the bride. You needed to see the bridegroom. And so they had these, these bridesmaids whose, whose job was to be a torchbearer, whose job was to just light up the area, light up the room. And so uh, they went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. So in this parable, do you see that? Just like it's setting up a comparison and a contrast. Five were wise and five were foolish. Which one do you want to be at the end of the story? Anybody? Have you picked out the group that you want to be? Why don't you choose the wise one? I want to be the wise one. I, nobody wants to, I, I went to church and I wanted to be the foolish one. We can teach you that, but do you want to be the wise one? So verse, when the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Now, how many fell asleep? At like, like a number, not just all of them, like 10, 10 fell asleep. So the wise fell asleep. The, the foolish fell asleep. You can fall asleep if you want to right now. You know, if this, you don't care about this, fall asleep. I don't care. Um, five were wise. All of them fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out to meet him, which is the whole purpose of their job was to meet the bridegroom. 
all the bridegrooms, all the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. So what's the difference between the wise and the foolish at this point in the passage? How many of them were prepared at the beginning of the day? All ten. All ten were prepared at the beginning of the day. Only five of them were extra prepared. They were, they were ready, like if this goes a long time, our lamps are going to keep burning. So many of us think in the end times that we're going to be caught off guard and it's going to happen suddenly and we're not going to have enough time. The problem of this passage is they had too much time. They weren't in it for the long haul. They weren't ready to say for the rest of, like I am ready however long this takes, I am ready and I will wait. I wonder how many of us are taken out just because we're tired waiting. We're tired persevering. We're tired just staying wise and staying, staying right with it. That was the problem in this passage. The next verses. But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. So here's what they had to do. The bridegroom is coming, and where are they going? To the store. They're heading to Walmart. Um, bridegroom comes, and like, oh man, maybe we can make a quick trip, get there, and nobody will ever know that we weren't prepared. But the problem is, while they were at Walmart, the bridegroom shows up. How many does he find right with him at that moment? Finds five. How many, uh, where were the other five? They're off, listen, they're off trying to get prepared. They're not off sinning. They're not off doing their own thing. They're off at that moment trying to get ready, trying to be prepared. And then there's just not enough time. It was like everything switches. First, there is too much time, and that becomes the problem. And then there's just not enough time to get ready. It says, then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. Um, it's a beautiful thing that they're saying. Uh, by, by declaring Jesus as Lord, uh, that's how we are all saved. It's not a, it's not a, a, a her, heretics there saying you're not Lord. They're declaring his lordship. It's just too late. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. Today, there are, there are three things that I just want to lift up for you about being ready. Like I, my, my desire, my deep desire is that every one of us be ready. You know what, if I don't share this message with you, I am held accountable. But I just need to warn you, once I share this with you, every one of us is accountable. Like we're accountable for this word. So here are three things that I believe that we must see in our lives if we're going to be ready. Number one, have you made a decision to be his follower? Uh, right next door in our garage area, there's a wall. Uh, it's a beautiful wall. I want to show you a picture of it. Uh, we just put this up. It says, it's an I have decided wall. This is, the, this is the whole wall. So this is a big, big area. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then there are signatures beside that because we want to we make it really clear, a decision to follow him needs to be made. So maybe the best thing you could do today would be to just walk in the garage, grab one of the pins by the light switch, sign it, and date it. Put, put the date in which you said yes to Jesus. You know, if you've never been baptized, baptism is the sign of like what happens in private needs to be made public. It's the day in which you say, you know what, I'm all in for Jesus. So I just want to ask you, have you made a decision 
Do you remember the decision that you've made to follow him? Second thing that I want for all of us to be prepared is I want you to guard, I want you to, to look at the state of your heart and the fire that's burning within you. In the previous chapter, Matthew chapter 24, uh, verse 12 and 13, one of the signs, like all of them are about earthquakes and famines and things that are happening in the world. This is not about the world. This is what's happening inside of us. You don't need to look at the, the news to see if your heart is still growing cold or hot. And he says this, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Again, there's a longevity to this. Was your heart white hot at one particular spot in your life, but now it might be growing cold? It says that's, that's kind of what's going to happen. It's one of the signs that people's hearts will start to grow cold in love for Him. Uh, last January, uh, we got Netflix for the first time. We'd never been on Netflix at all, uh, but like the crown is on, and when your wife, wife, wife wants the crown, you, uh, you get Netflix. And so we, we went and, and uh, got signed up for Netflix and started watching the crown. There were some other really, really cool shows that we started watching and, and enjoyed it. And uh, I, I want you to know, we canceled Netflix this week. <laughs> and the reason was, it's kind of that verse. Like sometimes you can just begin to look around and go, you know what? I, this is not going to make my heart grow hotter for him. This is not a message about Netflix. This is a message about your heart. There are things that make your heart grow cold. There are things that make your heart grow hot. And I think if you begin to ask the Holy Spirit, what are those things? Like the Holy Spirit will be very, very, very clear. Then obey you got to be ready. you got to keep your lamp burning, not just for a little bit of time, but let it keep going. Let, it, let yourself be ready when that time comes. Uh, for my birthday, we had a fire, uh, fire pit, had a nice roaring fire. It was really beautiful. A couple weeks ago when we were uh, having a fire, uh, we had these three logs that were right in the center on some hot coals, and they were burning. It was beautiful, but the night was getting long, and we were going to have roast marshmallows the next night uh, because you can't roast marshmallows too many times. And so we decided, like, let's let's put out the fire. Do you know how we put out the fire? Just took one log, put it away from the coals. Took another log, put it on another side away from the coals, and took another log and put it away. We didn't didn't put water on it. Didn't do anything. We just got it out of the fire. And when your log gets out of the fire, when it gets separated from being around others who are hot, you will grow cold. You know, that, those logs did not burn up. Those logs, the fire went out. You know, it's one of the sad things about right now. I believe that many of us, our logs are getting separated from one another. Our fires are getting separate. And I tell you, we need each other. We need each other so that our hearts don't grow cold. So that's one, number one. Have you made a decision? Where's your heart and has it grown cold? Number three, just be about the business of your calling. Just do what you were made to do, what you were called to do. You don't need to spiritualize it. You don't need to make it bigger than what it is. Just do what you were called to do. How many of the bridesmaids fell asleep? All of them. Like five of them were wise and fell asleep. It's okay to sleep. I want you to know that. It's okay to do whatever God has called you to do at that particular moment. And if it's the thing that God says, this is the best thing for you to do at this particular moment, then do it. It, you, you don't need to be sitting around watching the end times. You need to be preparing uh, your life to just do whatever God has called you to do. Um, so those are the three things. Have you made a decision for Him? Is your heart closer to Him and more on fire for Him than you've been at any point in your life? And number three, are you about doing the business of your calling and what God has created you to do? 
So Lord, I pray in this place as we just prepare, we want to be wise and not the foolish ones. God, we don't want to be at that moment when there's just not enough time to get ready. We don't want you to be looking at us and saying, I, I just don't know you. Because some of us can even look in the mirror and say, we don't even know the person that we're looking at the mirror. God, we want to be right. We want to be true. We want to be loyal. We want to be faithful. So in this moment, would you make this a holy place where we can get ready and get in that ready position for you? I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So we're just going to sing the chorus of that. stand with me. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we ask that you awaken our hearts. Awaken our hearts to you, Jesus. God, we know that you speak. Lord, we want to listen. So God, if we're confused about our calling, God, we ask that you give us clarity today and awaken our hearts in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for your words. He's calling, wake up, child. It's your time to shine. You were born such a time as this he's calling wake up child it's your time to shine cause you were born for such a time as this this is the anthem of a generation here we are God shake our nation all we need is your generation. Here we are, God, shake our nation. All we need is your love. You captivate me. Yes. God, we ask that you lead us. Lead us, Jesus. Let's just sing that. Won't you saying, you know, that Jesus Christ is alive, that he's on the throne, and I believe in him. I, I want you to know I believe in you as well. Like, I believe you have what it takes. I believe that you want to follow him, and, and as your pastor, I want to help you. If, if you're in a place where you just need a little help, a little, little guidance, a little encouragement, then come talk to me. I'd love that. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to just know what's going on in your life because I believe that every one of us can be and are called to be history changers. Like the next generation needs to be different because of the way you and I live our lives. We know that and you have what it takes. 
So I pray today that you go out and that you would be those history changers. I pray that you'd go out and be the church. I pray that you'd go out and hunger to, to win the lost to Jesus. Hunger to encourage. I pray that nothing would make your heart grow cold, but it would stay white hot this week for Jesus. You want that? In Jesus' name, amen. Go and be the church.